Okay, everybody, good morning. Um, welcome to Kabbalah Decoded, our online classes. This is Sunday morning, 9 20, 2015, at 10 in the morning, 10 ish. So, um, today we're going to talk about why change is so difficult. What makes it so difficult to change things? <clears throat> And obviously here we're talking about uh, changing our, not only changing our behavior, which is not that difficult to change, even though it becomes habitual, but it's possible to change that, but changing our emotional state. That is the issue that we really have to be dealing with. <clears throat> because changing the emotional, and a person's emotional state is extremely difficult. Particularly when a person is in a state of emotional arousal, it is very hard to um, sort of calm that person down from the feeling that they're having at the moment. For example, <clears throat> if a person's in a state of tremendous anger or tremendous uh, depression, one of those kinds of qualities, um, to divert him from that uh, particular thing is not at all easy. And if a person is, in general, an angry type of person, in other words, he blows up like a match, uh, flares up like a match, then any time um, um, something comes along which sets him off, so to speak, or her, uh, so automatically the, um, the, 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 the result is um, a terrible flare of anger or a bout of depression, which could last for um, many days, sometimes weeks, even months, even years, in fact. And the question is, why is it so difficult, and what can be done to change that particular situation? What can be done to change the brooding or the ruminating on that particular quality that that particular power of the soul, as it's called in Kabbalah, to um, move it from where it is to a more positive place. What can we do? So, <clears throat> first of all, let's discuss the reason for things to be um, so, why things are sometimes, why it's so difficult to change a, what's called a mida. The word mida, I'm going to write here in the chat, mida, M-I-D-D-A-H in, in English, or mem, Dalad Hay in um, Mem Dalad Hay in uh, in Hebrew. <clears throat> the reason that it's so difficult to change a Mida, first of all, the word Mida itself, it actually comes from the Hebrew word Medida, means to measure. So, how do you measure something? <clears throat> Usually you measure something with, uh, you use some kind of um, um, a vessel, let's say you're measuring a liquid weight or uh, even a uh, like flour or water or something like that. So you take a beaker or some kind of a cup and you measure out a cup of flour or a pound of flour or a kilogram of flour, whatever it may happen to be. And um, uh, so you use a cup or some kind of container to measure it. Or if you're measuring length, for example, so you would use a... Um, uh, a tape measure or something like that to uh, to measure it. Um, today, I think we use laser beams probably, but in any event, let's not go there. Um, or some other kind of uh, some kind of other measuring device. Similarly, with time, we would use a watch or a stopwatch to measure time. Now, let's focus for a moment on the instrument that is used for measurement. That instrument that is used for measurement, let's say you're measuring out a cup of flour or a cup of water. That cup is a fixed quantity. The cup itself doesn't change. Because if you would change that cup measure to something else, you wouldn't be getting a cup of flour or a cup of water or a cup of oil or whatever it is that you need. You would be getting a different measurement. Now, it's true that you could use two half cups to make one cup, but in general, in a general sense, just to, you know, to use this as an analogy, it's the vessel that doesn't change, simply with a tape measure. The tape measure is measured in inches, feet, centimeters, meters, whatever it may happen to be, millimeters. 
the tape measure itself doesn't change. The tape measure stays the same tape measure, and that's why it's useful to be able to always use it. Similarly with time, the watch is particularly, uh, it's based, the watch that we have is based on a fixed period of time, which is the same for everybody. There's seconds and there's minutes and there's hours and so on and so forth. And there's a calendar, if you're measuring longer periods of time, it's always fixed and it's the same for everybody. So if I tell you, if you're in England and I tell you I want a pound of flour, you'll measure about a pound of flour, the same they'll measure it out in, uh, in America probably. Now, interestingly enough, in more ancient times, in Talmudic times and pre-Talmudic times, in, in biblical times, measurements weren't fixed. Measurements were not fixed. Measurements went according to, very largely according to the person. So there were, more, there were approximate measurements. They weren't really fully um, universal measurements. There were measurements that went according to the person. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. For instance, if you wanted to measure a uh, space, a length, so the standard length in, um, in, in the Talmudic, um, in Talmudic, in Talmudic usage, uh, the standard length was the length of the forearm from the elbow to the tip of your middle finger. Now that wasn't the same for everybody. Obviously not everybody's forearm is the same thing, but you measure according to you. So in a sense, the person himself or herself becomes the source of measurement. You measure according to the human being, according to the person. Similarly with time. Time really was divided, not like it is uh, today into seconds and minutes in a very fixed kind of a sense, but time was more divided according to really the seasons. And the, uh, um, the crossing over of the seasons and the uh, intersection of the seasons and so on and so forth it was measured by the length of the lunar calendar and the solar calendar. So even though the solar calendar is, uh, is more precise, 365 and a quarter days approximately, but the lunar cal calendar changes quite a lot. And we gave a lecture once before about the differences between the two, the two calendars, the solar calendar and the lunar cal calendar. And uh, we discussed then that um, all Western civilization is really based on the solar calendar, but most Middle Eastern civilizations and others as well base themselves on a lunar calendar. So for instance, um, in the Islamic Arabic calendar, they would uh, have Ramadan, which is their main uh, festival. It's a month long, sometimes in the winter, sometimes in the summer, sometimes in the spring, etc., because the lunar calendar is only really, um, it's, it's much shorter, it's 11 days shorter than the, um, uh, than the solar calendar, more than 11 days shorter, so that um, that's within, within three years, there's already a month's difference between last and between three years ago and now, there's a month's difference in when the, uh, the festival will fall. Now, as far as I'm aware, I'm not 100% sure of this, but as far as I'm aware, the Jewish calendar, the calendar system is the only one that uses both measures, the lunar and the solar. And that's verses in the Torah that explain that, uh, the, that the Passover festival has to be in the spring. So that's where the sync, synchronization of the two calendars comes in. But they use both. Anyway, I don't want to get into the, into the weeds over here with the calendar. It's not uh, the purpose of this particular lecture. In any event... <coughs> the measure of things was much more fluid than it is today. And in fact, the more time goes on, the more precise and the more fixed measurements become. Um, so the metric system, for example, is something that's been adopted by most of the world. I think America is one, the one <laughs> the major exception. We still don't have a metric calendar for some reason, a metric uh, system for some reason. But nevertheless, that is the, um, the common, um, and the measurement, therefore, becomes an objective thing. It's not something subjective, it becomes objective outside of you. Now, this is a very good analogy to understand how it is that things are so difficult to change. Just like you can't change the measurement of a meter or the measurement of a yard, uh, to use the uh, American system. 
that that measurement is a universally accepted measurement. What a meter is, is universally accepted. What a cup is, is probably universally accepted. Uh, or a teaspoon. The only measurement that's not is a pinch, you know, a pinch of salt or a pinch of snuff or whatever, right? But, um, but the measurements have become completely, um, how shall I say, unchanging. You can't change the um, you can't change the measurement because then you change you're changing everything, you're changing the whole recipe. Now the same way with a mida, as we said before, the word mida. Um, if you have a look, mida m i d d a h in English, mem dalad hay in Hebrew, mida in Hebrew. So the um, the quality of that emotional expression which is called a mida the, that that quality doesn't change it's like a fixed measure just like a medida a medida meaning a measurement just like a measurement is a fixed thing so too a mida an emotional quality is a fixed thing and therefore it's extremely difficult to change it because it's sort of in a sense it's a universally accepted mode of operation, modus operandi, mode of acting, universally accepted in the milieu, in the, uh, in the, in the um, um, situation in which a person finds himself, that particular measure, the way he's measured out his soul, that's the way it's explained, the way he measures himself out, according to his midois, in other words, uh, let, let me just clarify something over here. There's something called Moichin. Moichin. Let me write it in the chat box over here. Moichin. M-O-C-H-I-N. Or if you want to write it in Hebrew, it would be Moichin. Right? Uh, sorry, I made a mistake here. Uh, Moichin. Mochin means intellect, or the intellectual properties of a person. The intellectual, um, oh, I didn't, here we go. Yeah, mochin. Mochin means the intellectual properties of a person. Mochin, that is changeable. I can, my understanding of something changes. As a person matures, things change. As a person uh, uh, looks at things differently, or understands things from a different angle, or has a different, finds a different explanation for something. So his intellectual properties, his way of thinking of things changes. And that's um, a perfectly natural thing. And a good thing, mochin is fluid. The intellect is fluid. Emotions, midot, are not fluid. As we said before, the midot are like the measuring sticks, the yardsticks, the cups, the um, the one-pound measures or whatever it is, or the uh, volume measure of uh, of water or flour. It doesn't change. It's a standardized things, a standardized thing. Why is that? To a very large extent, because emotions. Um, emotions are interactive qualities. They're how we interact with the world. They interact with the world. Uh, I'll get you back to you, Avner, in a second. Uh, they interact with the world, whereas the mochin are an internal assessment of a situation. Now, I think what Avner is um, talking about, Avner says he would think that the opposite would be true, that the emotions are fluid and that intellect is um, fixed. Now, you're probably thinking of things like, uh, like uh, axioms, right? Like axioms of a system also unchanging, unchanging generally axioms, axiomatic thoughts. But we're just talking, we're talking about the uh, thought process. If a person's ever had any, uh, if any of you have ever had a dream and you remembered it, <laughs> Most of us dream most of our lives, right? But um, uh, if you ever had a dream, you'll see that your mind flits from one thing to another with incredible rapidity without any, it's, it's like there's no, it's completely fluid. There's no, it's like stream of consciousness. When we say a stream of consciousness, what do we mean stream of consciousness? It means there's no real thread going through. It's just whatever pops into your mind. 
And there's a lot of things that are popping into our mind, one after the other, one after the other. If you sit and watch your thoughts for a while, you'll see that this is true. Your mind is constantly changing. And the way you think about things is also constantly changing. For example, I'll give you a, a very good example of uh, which is given um, in the book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's not. It's given in another book. Um, it's, it's, it's in another book by Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky. I forget what it's called now. In any event, he tells a story. I think it's, a, anyway, I think so, whatever. No, it's not, it's not that relevant. But um, he tells the story of, uh, he got on a train. And a man got onto the train with uh, three children. And he went and he sat down on the train. And um, the kids were just sort of going wild. They were absolutely going wild. And the man was just, he just sort of ignored them completely. So there was a person also sitting in the train there. And he turned to him and he said to him, uh, you know, could you please like control your children? I mean, they're disturbing everyone in the, uh, everyone in the carriage. It is in seven habits. Okay. So they're disturbing everybody in the carriage. So um, the man looked up and he looked at his kids and he called them over and he said, sit them down. And he turned to the person who had told him to control his kids and he said, I'm really sorry. Uh, you know, I do apologize. Um, their mother just passed away. Their mother just died. And that's like, they don't know how to, ha how to handle it. Neither do I. And uh, his perspective on things changed completely. Obviously, the person who criticized him for not looking after his kids now felt instead of, uh, you know, he looked at it in a different, a completely different way. So he, he, he apologized for his, uh, for his being rude and so on and so forth and wasn't, um, you know, in any event. So we can see how changing in perspective on something completely changes the situation. <clears throat> a paradigm shift, exactly, right? But a paradigm shift is a mental paradigm shift. That's exactly right. It's called a paradigm shift, uh, having a, pointed out <clears throat> so the reason now that the midas that the midot the these uh, these midot the emotional qualities which again medidot they're measuring out of the soul of one's life force in relation to other people the reason that these midot do not change easily is because of their source the source of the emotions is such that to change them would require a tremendous, tremendous amount of efforts, if they can even be changed. Now, let me um, do a screen share over here so you can see a chart of the Svirot. Here we go. I assume now that everybody can see a chart of the Svirot. In front of you, it's not all of the Svirot. Let me go down a little bit so you can see. Um, or maybe I could reduce it a little bit. So oh, there we go. That's better. Okay. Can you still see? Everything's okay? If there's, not, if there's a problem, if you can't see it, if it's too small now, just um, it's okay. All right. Okay, so if you can see the sphere right now, now here is, um, here is what I want you to see here. These, these emotional qualities here, these over here, these are really the emotional qualities, these ones outlined now in blue, in the blue box. They're called Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. And to a certain extent, Malchut, I'll come back to that later. B maybe. But primarily, these are the emotional qualities. When these Sfirot, now what are the Sfirot? The Sfirot are really the structure of the worlds. When the worlds are created, when God created the worlds, so there's various planes of reality. There's five planes of reality called the five worlds. And each of these worlds has an inner structure. It's the same inner structure. The inner structure is sort of these ten dimensions. Starting off with Keter, the highest one, and then Chochmah, Bina, etc., etc. That is sometimes not counted. I'll explain that another time. But these are the, the these are the intellectual qualities. Yeah, Chochmah, Bina, and Dat are the intellectual qualities. Whereas Chesed, Gvuret, Tiferet, etc., etc., 
Netzachot Yesod are the emotional qualities. Now, they correspond in emotions too, just in the positive sense. Chesed is love. Gvura is awe, A-W-E, or fear. Tiferet, compassion, a mixture of Chesed and Gvura, mediates between the two. Netzach is a sense of certainty, sometimes translated as victory, but in the soul, it's a sense of certainty, self-confidence, etc. Hod is the concept of sincerity and gratitude. There's actually several levels of each of these three rot. I'm just giving the basic ones. And your sword is either truth, truthfulness, connection, uh, truthfulness or connection. Those are the those are the basic emotional qualities. Now all of these are subdivided, and there's mixtures between them, etc., etc. I'm just giving you the basic point. Now, what is the origin of these? Where do these come from? Where do these these six midot, these six emotional qualities? really have their root in Keter. Their root is in Keter. So although the expression is used, Moach Sholit Al Halev, that the mind rules the heart, naturally a, person, a person's mind, his mental powers rule the heart, Moach Shalit Alalev, it explains in Tanya in many places, and uh, it's from, uh, in fact, um, it's from the Zohar. Nevertheless, when it says that the mind rules the heart, it only rules over the expressions of the heart, or what is called in, uh, in Kabbalistic and Hasidic terminology, Chitzon Yut Halev the outer dimensions of the heart, but not the inner dimensions of the heart. The inner dimensions of the emotions are not controlled by the mind. Therefore, it is only when these emotions are in a calm or a weakened state that they can be controlled by the mind. But when they're in an aroused state, they cannot be controlled by the mind. Why? Because their root is higher than intellect, their root is in Keter. The root of the emotions is in Keter. Nevertheless, that doesn't leave us completely without um, without the means to, to really deal with the emotions. It's still possible to deal with the emotions. Let me just stop sharing for a minute and go back to our previous um, Right. So, let me explain now what I mean. But first I'm going to tell you a little story. <clears throat> There's a story about um, the Alter Rebbe, he's called the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zalman Liadi, who was the first Rebbe of Lubavitch, of Chabad, uh, one of the Hasidic dynasties, one of the very important Hasidic dynasties. And he was the disciple of Rabbi Dovber of Mizrich, who was the chief disciple of the Baal Shem Tov. So this was the third generation. And uh, young Rabbi Shneer Zalman, before he actually became the head of a new dynasty, um, had gone to study with the Magid of Mizrich, with his master, his teacher. And he had spent some time there, and it was time for him to go home. He had uh, left his home, and he came uh, to study. He was been there for six months. It was time for him to go home. Uh, he was intending to come back anyway, but whatever. But um, he um, was planning on going home. Now, he's learning his study partner in... Um, Whenever we study as students, it's not like a, you know, when you go into a library you know, you have a, in a university where everyone is sort of studying on their own and they're all trying to cram it in on their own. In uh, the Jewish method of doing things, uh, the didactic method or the, um, the learning method of, uh, the method of learning in, in, in Jewish tradition is you always study in partners. 
right? Partner studied together. So his partner in um, his study partner was the son of the Magadir Mizrich, uh, who was named quite appropriately the angel Amalach, Avraham Amalach. His name was Abraham, Avraham Hamalach, Abraham the angel. Right? That's what they called it. Why? Because he was so sort of ethereal and non worldly. He was a person that sort of his consciousness was, <laughs> was constantly in a different world. And just to, ex to, to explain uh, what this means, once he and his uh, Rabbi Shneir Zalman, Rabbi Avraham and Rabbi Shneir Zalman were meditating together, uh, and they both went to extremely high levels, and Rabbi Shneir Zalman suddenly realized that if they drift any further off, there's no coming back. So he quickly aroused himself, and then he saw that his friend, uh, his study partner, was drifting higher. So he quickly grabbed a bagel, broke off a piece, and stuffed it in the mouth of the malach of uh, Rabbi Avraham, so that he shouldn't he shouldn't drift away completely. So that's who Rabbi Avraham was. He was he was it was sort of very angelic, very otherworldly kind of a person. In any event. Um, as Rabbi Shneur Zalman was going, he was about to leave. So they had called the carriage um, to come and uh, take him to the train or whatever it was, or he was going by carriage. I don't know if there were trains yet in those days in that area. In any event, um, he... Um, no, there was still only carriages. Yeah, so he um, he was just about to get on the carriage. He was carrying his like little suitcase or whatever he had with him. And the Malach, Rabbi Avraham, turned to the carriage driver and he said to him, whip the horses until they no longer know that they're horses. Whip the horse, or, or rather, whip the horses until they forget that they're horses. Whip the horses until they are no longer horses. That was the, uh, that's what he said. Whip the horses until they're no longer horses. At which Rabbi Shneur Zalman put down his bag and he turned to the Malach and he said to him, up until now, I knew that you whip the horse until they know that they're a horse, right? You whip the horse until he knows he's a horse. But this is a whole new level of, uh, of, of operation over here. Whip the horse until he's no longer a horse, then I have to learn. And he took his bag and he went back to his uh, hotel or whatever, wherever, wherever he was staying. And he decided he's not, uh, he's not leaving right yet. He's not ready to leave yet. Now, what do we mean over here? Initially, the first step in spiritual achievement, spiritual what's called avoda or avoida, working on yourself in a spiritual sense is so that a person really becomes a human being. Not a horse, obviously. But just like the horse becomes a horse or knows that as a horse, a human being has to know what it means to be a human being. What are the human qualities that are fully expressive of humanness? Everyone in his own way. But what are the qualities by which a human being is a human being? So that I know, that I was taught already, that I learned. How to be a human being, how to be a full expression of godliness within this world as a human being, that I know. But what I don't yet know is how to transcend your humanness to become godly rather than human, or rather than just human. Let's call it superhuman. And I don't mean in the sense of Superman that, uh, you know, can do all kinds of weird and wonderful things. I just mean someone who's beyond in his level of consciousness and his, uh, his emotional qualities and so on, beyond what the average person ever achieves. So I said, this I don't know, and he went back to his hotel. <clears throat> his lodging, rather. So... This is what we're uh, talking about here. The initial, the initial um, level of emotional response 
emotional interaction with the world. Again, the emotions are the interactive component of our natures. The emotions initially have to come under the, um, I'm going to go back to the share screen again. Uh, the emotions are, are, have to go back to that quality of the way they were initially structured by God. In, the, in, in other words, the, the initial soul qualities that we're supposed to have, we have to perfect those as human beings. How do we do that? We do that through a process of using our intellect, Chochmah, Bina, and Dat, to guide the emotions in the right way. The mind rules over the heart. However, when the emotions are in a state of tremendous arousal, passion, then the mind does not rule over the heart. As we all know, when a person is in a tremendous state of anger, for example, he can do things which if he was thinking about it, he knows it would be detrimental to the rest of his life. I didn't go um, uh, punch somebody, uh, hurt them, or worse, uh, in anger, and he knows it's detrimental. He knows it's not going to do him any good. He knows that intellectually, but he can't control it. So the only way that they can be controlled is for the emotions to be in a state of calmness first. First, they have to become calm. The emotions have to become calm. That's a process that requires time, it requires effort, it, 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 it usually takes quite a, uh, quite a long time before they become sufficiently, um, sufficiently calmed down to be able to really work with them. But all that, all that happens really is that the outer aspect, the expression of the emotion changes, but the emotions themselves remain, unless one can change them all the way in their source, all the way in their source. Now, this is a rather complex, um, a rather complex thing. Let me explain what I'm talking about. To become superhuman, in other words, not just be human, which is when the mind, the intellect, when proper intellect, intellect understanding the way things should really be, how a human being should really be, is, has controlled the emotions, and the person has control over all of his emotional uh, components, emotional aspects, that is to be human. To be beyond human is when one is able to change these qualities into godly qualities. Now I'll explain to a certain extent, how this is done. Uh, bear with me, it is a little bit complex. As I said before, the root of the emotions is in Keter, as I said before. Now, in Keter itself, and I'm going to make a box here around Keter, in Keter itself, in Keter itself, which is the highest of the Svirot. In fact, all the other Svirot besides Keter are called imminent. Keter is called transcendent. It's the transcendent, that's where the transcendent powers of the soul lie. What are the transcendent powers of the soul? The transcendent powers of the soul are the highest one corresponding to Radla, Reisha Delois Yada. Radla, corresponding to that is Emuna, faith. The next level of Keter, the next level down in Keter, is called Atik. Called Atik. Atik corresponds to Ta'anug, or the delight of the soul. And the lowest level of the soul, or the lowest level of Keter, rather, is called, uh, is called Arich, or Arich Anpin. Arich Anpin being... Uh, that aspect of the soul which is manifested in will, a person's will. Now, 
these emotional qualities over here from Chesed, what we said before, the ones that we highlighted before, those are called Za'er Anpin. And the lowest level of Keter is called Arich Anpin. Zer Anpin means the small countenance. And the Arich Anpin means the large or the long countenance. The small countenance, the long countenance. In other words, these basically have their origin or are, um, can be controlled by the will. Will can control these. Why? Because this is the long face, Arich Anpin, and this is the small face, Zair Anpin. So the will can control the emotions. If a person wills it, he can control his emotions. The problem is that this emotional control might sometimes, if it's the wrong thing, could be detrimental to a person's um, inner being. And I'll explain what I mean. The emotions that a person has, the emotional quality of a person, ultimately stem from his function in this world. Just to start off a step earlier, every human being who lives in this world has a mission in the world, a calling. The purpose for which he was created, the purpose for which his soul came down to this particular body. Everybody has a purpose in the world. And everybody has a unique purpose in the world. If a person is not fulfilling his purpose, that is going to cause the sort of an inner strife, an inner unhappiness, an inner dissatisfaction. Only when a person is fulfilling his purpose in the world, he's going to see, feel that sense of fulfillment, of, of, um, of being in sync with himself. Sometimes they call it in psychology, they call it flow. He's going to be in a state of flow. Because that's who he is. Now, how do we know what that inner person is? We can tell from the dominant emotions in a person what his, um, what his makeup is. It could be from the positive dominant emotions. It could be from the negative dominant emotions. Both of them give us a clue as to who this person is. Now, the dominant positive emotions, and everyone has some positive emotions, are much more pleasant to work with. They're more pleasant to work with simply because if we start digging into all the negative qualities and all the negative emotions, it is um, automatically arouses resistance. And resistance is very hard to work with. Why? Because they're being backed up by the will. These emotions being backed up by the will, which is why they can't be changed. They're being backed up by the will. That's the way I interface with the world. That's my measurement. That's my measurement of myself. How do we get a person to change? By not measuring himself in the same way, by measuring himself in a different way. And that's a process that has to be learned. Or essentially by what, by what we call self-transcendence. So, the way a person is, the way he re relates to the world is a clue as to what the the goal or the, uh, the, uh, the purpose of his soul is in this world. What the purpose of his soul is in this world. And we can look at it again from either negative or positive qualities which manifest themselves. If we see essentially the negative qualities, like for example, if we're dealing with patients or clients who are very negative, anger management problems um, or uh, depression problems and so on and so forth. So those qualities even though they are um, uh, destructive at this point in time, can nevertheless be used by redirecting them a little bit. Instead of trying to stop them and trying to change them because then the will comes in and it backs them up right away, try and redirect them in a way that instead of giving the person a, um, uh, uh, leading him into negative things, 
they can lead him into positive things. For example, let's say a person has a problem with anger, right? That anger could be used in a positive sense. Our sages say, Loyalam Yargis Adam is Atmala Yetzahara. A person should make himself angry about his negative impulses. Or a person can make himself angry, he can be angry about injustice done to others in the world. That anger, in other words, can be used. Now, anger is a very dangerous uh, thing to try and use. It's certainly better to try and change it altogether. But it is something that can be used. Anger and indignation can be very closely associated. So one can change the anger into indignation or anger about something else. If the person is a person, is a bal gvurois, is a person who has gvura, gvura being this, um, this quality over here, right? Gvura, which is related to anger in the negative sense, is related to fear and awe in the positive sense, fear of God, fear, divine fear. Um, if a person can change that into, uh, in, into uh, positive things, well and good, if he can redirect it into the positive. Because what will happen when, these, when any negative quality is redirected, slightly redirected into a positive thing, then not only will the will be backing it up in its positive manifestation, but then the, also the second level of Keter, as we described before, the second level of Keter, which is called Atik or Atik Yoimin, will now derive delight from the fact that the person is now in sync. Because ultimately, even though we said that, that the, uh, the, it's the lowest level of Keter that controls the emotions, nevertheless, their source, according to the Zohar, is actually in the second level of Keter, called Atik or Atik Yomin. Atik Yomin means the ancient of days. There's seven days of the week, there's seven emotions of the soul. Primarily six and the seventh is a little bit different, Malchut. But that's their source. In other words, who you are, what you are, what you're here for, when you're fulfilling it, that's what gives you delight. When you're expressing who you are fully in a proper way, that's when the soul has its delight. That's when the soul feels its delight, the middle level. The problem is that, that, that the, the, the will often blocks that delight from being felt. The will is backing up the way a person views himself in this world, and therefore, he's always sort of out of sync. He's an angry person. He's a person who's, uh, let's say, very, um, uh, if we're talking about on the side of Chesed, a person who is into, uh, let's say, addictions. He loves like certain things which are, which are not good for him. It's a negative quality of Chesed. Um, so, in order to be able to change, uh, I'll get to that uh, in a second, uh, Moshe. Uh, so, in order to be able to change this, what uh, the first thing to do is don't try and change the, if a person is an angry person, or a person is, a, let's say, a very, uh, very passionate person on the side of chesed, physical passion and so on, don't try and stop it, block it. It won't work to block it because he'll just use the, all of his willpower to force it through. Rather, what a person needs to do is redirect it. Redirect the chesed into positive things. Redirect the gvura, the anger, into positive things. This can be done with ourselves and so on and so forth. And then the person feels in sync with his original origin of these emotions, which is in Atik, Atik Yomin. Uh, so, how is a lack of self-confidence redirected? A lack of self-confidence, what, what, what really is a, uh, uh, a lack of self-confidence? Self-confidence comes from Netzach, right? Self-confidence comes from Netzach. Now, there's a positive quality to a lack of self-confidence. A lack of self-confidence means ultimately, that a person has a certain humility. Humility and, and a lack of self-confidence are very closely related, except what? 
humility is the positive side of a lack of self-confidence. So, if a person can use that lack of self-confidence to be directed into not being, um, not increasing the, the, the lack of self-confidence, but rather into humility. Now, what, what, where humility, the, the root of humility is really in Chochmah, right? Chochmah Koachmah, or um, uh, as, as it's called in Hasidic terminology, Bitu. So how does one transform a lack of self-confidence into, into a higher level, the higher level of humility? Well, the way to do it is essentially to, there, there, there are several dimensions in which it can be done. First of all, there's various exercises uh, which one can do to increase the self-confidence, but redirecting it through humility. When a person is humble means someone who doesn't have what to be humble about is really not, uh, not so much a humble person. A humble person is someone who has tremendous qualities of character or tremendous qualities of intellect or whatever, and nevertheless does not react to other people by putting himself up on a pedestal and they down on the, uh, sort of down on the floor. Um, and I'll give you, uh, I'll tell you a little story that illustrates this. There was a story about the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe and his brother. Uh, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe was actually the younger brother, but he later on became the Rebbe. So the two brothers were playing once. And uh, the older brother, was, seems to, seems he was a little jealous of his younger brother. Um, because the younger brother was taller and he was shorter. He, even though he was older, he was shorter than his younger brother. So he took his younger brother, it was sort of a ditch, and he put his younger brother in the ditch. And he, um, uh, he said, now I'm taller than you. And the father was watching, he was the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe. So uh, his, the father was watching and he said, he called the boy and he said to him, he said, uh, I know you want to be taller than your brother, but there's a, there, there, you don't have to put him in the hole in order for you to be bigger. You can stand on a chair. And then you'll be bigger. He'll be higher. He'll be taller. <laughs> so um, the the idea being, what was his uh, his intention here? His intention was, you can lift yourself up rather than put somebody else down. When a person is lacking in self confidence, because he's putting himself down, instead of lifting himself up, how do you lift yourself up? You lift yourself up by seeing that really you have tremendous amount of things to be really uh, confident about and proud of. And there's, there's ways of, of structuring these ideas and these patterns of thinking so that you will see that the, um, the, 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 the aspect of lack of self-confidence can easily be turned into confidence. There's other ways of doing it as well by using the opposite quality. I don't want to go into that now, but, um, but it is definitely um, uh, redirectable into positive ways of thinking about oneself. Uh, judgmental. Uh, let's not get into all of the, um, the, the uh, individual qualities here because it'll take, uh, take a long time. If anyone's interested, we can uh, perhaps have a session together and I can explain these things a little bit better in terms of their own um, um, particular quality. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, are there any other questions which are not um, sort of individual questions which I don't really want to deal with now? Um, any other questions which... Um, which I could answer? Right, since, since there don't seem to be any questions right now, I'll just answer this one quickly. Uh, yeah, the change comes from the root. Essentially, the change comes from the root. It's The change really comes from being in sync with what your root is. 
when a person's in a state of flow, as the psychologists call it, or is in a state of being in sync with his essential being, then those negative emotions just don't happen. Um, is a good exercise you can recommend? It depends on what the quality is. So I don't want to say it in general because there are very specific um, techniques which are used for each of the different qualities of character. First one has to find out the quality of character. Uh, that one's talking about, or the negative quality, that's one that, that one's talking about. It is always better to focus on the positive other side of it than on the negative. In other words, again, if there's a self, if there's a lack of self-confidence, it's better to focus on those things that in fact do engender confidence. And what's behind this, the lack of self-confidence in a positive sense is really the aspect of humility. So use the humility in the right way, but humility means, um, ascribing the quality to what is higher than oneself. Then positive qualities that one has, you ascribe them to what is higher than you are, knowing that they're not yours, they're sort of, so to speak, on loan to you, so that you can do your job. They're the tools that you're given so you can do your job. And all of the qualities is the same thing, to speak about in a general sense. All of the qualities that we have come from qualities that we've been given to do the job that we have to do. So they're sort of tools on loan from above so that we can fulfill what it is that we placed for in this world. That is what essentially, in other words, every quality has its root in a positive thing. Even something like anger has its root in a positive thing. There was a great, one of the great Hasidic rabbis named uh, Rabbi Baruch Mezibish, was a person who expressed himself with, uh, in, in a very sometimes he expressed himself in a very harsh way to, uh, towards other people. In other words, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't allow people to, to use fluff, if you know what I mean. He wouldn't allow them to use fluff. He cut right to the chase, and sometimes it was brutal, <laughs> you know. Uh, to, to use a vernacular, I don't like to use these kinds of expressions, but it explains it perfectly. Cut the crap, right? That's the way he would say it. You know, it's like cut the, cut the nonsense, right? Let's get to the let's get to the issues. And sometimes it will be very very harsh, and people will be like they would take it personally, and sometimes and get upset and so on. Before he passed away, he left open a book of the Zohar, which speaks about the word. His name was Baruch. Baruch actually means blessed, but. Um, he spoke about, the, uh, the Zohar speaks in a certain place about the quality of Baruch, what it means that blessed is Gvurot Gdoshot, that is a holy Gvurot, the holy severities. And he left the book open on that page just before he passed away, then he passed away, and when they went and they saw, said that they, you know, they understood then what it was that he was doing. He wasn't just, uh, you know, a... Uh, um, a short-tempered uh, person. He was doing it for a specific purpose. Cut out the, cut through the nonsense, cut out the fluff, and let's get to the core. That's what he did. In any event, uh, okay, folks, I think that's it for today. And um, I will post this on, uh, probably post it on YouTube at some point in time today. Also, you can download it if you want from my website, um, which or you can watch it again on the website. There's one of the kabbaladecoded.com. There's one tab that says videos and various other things, whatever. Go to the video tab. And then the latest video is, uh, it says the latest video button, an orange button. And just press there. And uh, you will be able to watch it again if you need. Okay. All the best and have a good day. Don't forget to use your time in the best possible way to grow in spirituality, in kindness, good deeds, and um, all good things.